Welcome. Today is Friday, May 1st. I'm excited today. We are going to be talking about creative pivots for restaurants during COVID. And I'm coming from the University of Northern Iowa. The program is Advance Iowa. And the focus of putting this together was today was the acknowledgement that we know that COVID has been tough on the restaurant industry. And the guest that I have today, I don't have to say that more than once uh, because he's living it. And so the thing that we decided as a center that could be potentially most helpful to other restaurants was to start to think about creative pivots. Because unfortunately, I'm reading a headline that's here right now and it's talking about COVID could decimate the restaurant industry and what can be done about it. So our hope is just by having conversations with some individuals like Matt. Yesterday we had a conversation which was not, it was retail uh, related, um, but talking about some individuals that have figured out how to do pivots and figure out how to do them well and creatively, then it'll help others uh, think about their situation and be able to move forward and figure out uh, and navigate what our new normal is. So today I'd like to welcome Matt Lamos from East Bremer Diner in Waverly. And I'm gonna start by Matt, tell us a little bit about you and the restaurant. Uh, grew up in Denver, Iowa, went to Denver High School, went to Wartburg, communications degree, moved out to Vegas for about five years, got some really neat experience with some really neat people out there, and then came back and bought the East Bremer Diner from the Landau family about, gosh, what are we, almost six years ago now we bought it, and the restaurant's been here for about 20, um, and the Landaus are notorious in our area for the restaurant world. They've done so much for the restaurant culture in the last 40 years in our area, Don and his sons, and um, it's it was neat to be trained by them. They have so a I great think, reputation. Oh, just, just phenomenal. And I will tell you what, the behind the scenes stuff that the Landaus are really good at, being able to learn from them, it was almost eight years in total, I got to kind of kind of be mentored by them. So um, you didn't necessarily bring the restaurant piece in, but more of the marketing creative piece when you came, when you decided to become a restaurant owner? Yes. Yeah, so the Landau's and I think we all, we all knew that the transition time was good because the restaurant had been here about 15 years at the time when we bought it. And we knew there was going to, it was going to be going through a transition. We knew the road construction was going to be coming in. We knew that mm -hmm. um, the point of sale systems in the restaurant, that was all change our industry is under a big change in the next decade. And it was a really neat time to transition where I had this experience from some people that had done this forever. So the foundation and the way they ran the staff and the way they, they had the restaurant set up, it was all there. Yes. So it gave me something to, you know, you didn't need to develop that yourself. You just got to grow it and kind of alter its path or pivot like we're all talking about right now. And, you know, that was a gentle pivot. And the pivots we're talking about in this six month period right now are a little bit harder. They're, uh, they're a little bit quicker and they're more of a 90 degree pivot versus, you know, a two degrees here and a four degrees here. And, uh, exactly. It's a fun industry though. Well, so kind of leaping from that point, take us back six weeks ago. <laughs> and as we're starting to learn about COVID and then you're starting to see what ultimately is going to be a dramatic change, tell us about what was happening in your business and, and what was going through your mind. Wow. Um, that actually, it's, it's tough when you're the, the owner probably and, you, and you're on site as much as we are here because we're such a piece of it. Um, I remember sitting down, I know right where I was, I'm looking at the space now. Um, when the when we got the um, the note from the state, basically on the press conference, it said we had to close. And we're sitting here with our staff. We're ready to open. We knew it was going to be slower than normal, and then we we're told to close. And it's really interesting owning and operating your business. And like Waverly had three years of road construction, so you're used to getting through these things. Mm -hmm. and, so we're prepping ourselves psychologically to, to get through the virus and how are we going to run the rest? Totally get it. So there's no, you know, there's not bad blood or anything. It was the right decision, but it was hard to swallow as a business owner, especially when 
the first thought for me wasn't, you know, are we going to be supported? What's going to happen? It was, we have 38 people that work here. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Um, so the, the first thing we had to start thinking about was what happens with all those people? How do you make sure like they're, they're somehow taken care of when you have no revenue coming in at that point? Mm -hmm. Like everything just changed in about 10 minutes. Um, the neat thing for our restaurant and our culture is as hard as that was to swallow, we had been talking about, well, what happens if this, what happens if this, and what happens if this? So, you know, that, that came out on a press release, we're told to close and we went to plan A because we had a plan A. And then- And so you had it fairly clearly defined at that point, or it was your mind had gone there and your team had gone there? Our minds were there and our team had gone there and we had the rough layout of what okay. our was gonna look like. And then as more information came out from the state and from the Fed, um, we kept making different decisions, but we kept making decisions that were preemptively planned. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? We, we yeah, it does. Up, we knew what those pivot turns were gonna be already. And that's that's not my leadership style, that's our team. We just, we happen to have, so let's rewind. Everything we're doing now, and the reason that we will get through this as a restaurant and probably as an industry is the restaurants that focused on their cultures mm -hmm. in the last five years, the last 10 years, the last 15 years have built teams that are able to make these pivots. Where it's it's a little cool. bit, because I don't think, you know, when you think about a restaurant and culture, I don't think there's a real appreciation for that. And even from a management or an ownership sometimes. So talk a little bit about what that looks like at East Bremer Diner and what you've done to be intentional about shaping culture. Well, Jane, we're gonna, um, <laughs> we'll, use your, we'll use your daughter as an example. Who well, and that's it. I was gonna say, <laughs> I love to talk this direction with you and I'll, I'll throw in a couple pieces because my daughter, full disclosure, did work at East Bremer Diner the beauty of it is uh, she did that in college. Previous to that, in her senior year, she worked for a large family chain restaurant. So she was able to kind of compare. Mm -hmm. And so it was interesting for me. And that's why I said, um, it's easy to say culture in a restaurant, but they were vastly different and they didn't have to be. Um, so it goes a lot to the leadership style. So that's what I wanted to lend your voice to of how to be intentional and what it looks like at East Bremer Diner because it is amazing. Um, we allow the staff to pivot at any point in time so we don't wait for COVID-19 to come in and say hey how do you guys feel what should we do. Um, it's a normal daily thing for me to sit back and let the staff make a mistake with with my baby. Um, a controlled mistake sometimes but a growing mistake so um, Mackenzie, your daughter, she came in one day and um, she is extremely environmental friendly. She, she has this mindset to make her world a better place and it's amazing. So she came in one day and asked me about uh, cardboard and some other things. And we sat down and I said, we would love to do more than what we're doing as far as being green. And I said, Here's where we've run into an issue as a restaurant. And it was on a financial side because it, it was counterintuitive to, to do some of these things that she would want to do. And I explained to her why. I said, but if you find a different thing, let me know. She comes back to me about two or three days later and has crunched numbers and found these different programs that I didn't even know were around and showed me how not only were we going to save it's like six times the amount of cardboard than we used to be saving. We actually dropped our, our um, payments going out $50 a month to make all that happen. And we're sending out less trash. So, and that's one example of how you just, and Mackenzie was not a manager. She wasn't a full-time employee. She worked a couple shifts a week. Mm -hmm. but we wanted, she had this, this, she wanted to do this thing. So it's like, take your hands off and let her do it. 
because well, the and one, of, one of the pieces that I think supports that, um, if you've not had the opportunity to go to East Bremer Diner, when you go in the back door and you come through the hall to bring you into the restaurant, there is a wall that's a chalkboard. And Matt, tell, tell people what's on the chalkboard and how you guys were able to put that together because I think it speaks volumes on how you create ownership amongst staff like Mackenzie to bring ideas and to look at their environment and know that they have influence and ideas. Um, so we, we have what we call the goal wall and it's not anything that another business couldn't replicate tomorrow. The middle school at the um, Waverly Starlock Middle School actually replicated it. They called us up and they have one there for their administration now. Um, we, we require everyone that works here to have some sort of personal professional goal. I don't, I don't care what it is. I want, I want to hire people and that's my dishwashers to my managers. I want them to think about something they want to accomplish. Again, that could be inside these four walls. It could be outside, but I want their mindset thinking, what is it that I wanted to accomplish? Because if I can get them to do that in, in one area of their lives, they're going to be better for us internally because I'm going to teach them if they don't already know how we're going to teach them how to think goal oriented, which means they're going to help our business grow, which means if they see this thing in the dish room and it's a 15 year old high school kid who's coming in four four hours a week to do dishes, maybe they're going to see an efficiency that we have overlooked. Mm-hmm. But if I don't help them get in that mindset of critical thinking or goal setting or any of this, it's not something that comes naturally to everyone right now. Yeah, I totally agree. But I see the voice that you're creating and the energy that comes out of that as a staff. So let's talk about some of the ideas that you've put together for COVID. And I made a list and it was kind of funny as I'm putting it together. First of all, you already had a huge following on Facebook. I think you have over 5,000 people that have likes. Um, so it means you already have some engagement there. And so community bingo, um, themes for the staff in terms of how they dress. Um, I saw 50s themes, superhero night, PJ night is tonight, uh, remote delivery. Um, you have COVID-19 business conversations that you've put up and have picked people from the CEO of the hospital to a former resident that's beloved by many uh, here in Waverly to talk about what he's missing. I saw the dad, dad joke battle. There's a second um, one coming. I got some more people in the next one. So, <laughs> so that range of ideas, and we'll talk about some of them independently, but Tell us how you got to a point that you have so many things happening in a time when most restaurants are just spinning to figure out how to move to takeout or delivery. Um, we, were, we were blessed in the sense that we knew, so delivery is something our industry has to do. For a restaurant that's going to survive before COVID-19, delivery was something a restaurant had to figure out how to do. So we actually started it very softly in the fourth quarter last year. So we were blessed with getting our feet a little bit wet mm -hmm. because it overtook our business now. So we didn't have to learn how to do it. We had to learn how to get better at it. Um, so part of that was timing and just, we knew that that was coming anyway. And for uh, a business that doesn't do delivery, <laughs> Tell us a little bit in terms of what words of wisdom would you give someone that's now having to do that quickly? Any well, words of advice? From the business standpoint, make sure the insurance is correct. Cause that was okay. a huge learning curve for me. You thought you could, like, you assume you could just start delivering. And then you talk to somebody like Gary Grace over at Jimmy John's and you learn more about the delivery. And you're like, Oh shoot. I need to make sure I'm covered first. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's number one, make sure you're covered. Uh, the other one is, Food quality is so hard, especially for us, because our food is not made to deliver. Um, and you have a big menu. A huge menu, huge menu. And we're doing the whole menu for delivery. We didn't limit the menu, which is one reason our revenue didn't drop as much as it could have, is we made the choice to continue to try to try to handle our full menu. And that's a mm -hmm. whole topic. That, that might not be for everybody. 
Um, but food quality is one of the biggest things. And the other thing is honesty. You know, we did a Denver delivery last evening and I was on the phone with some people and one of them was getting a hot beef, which is an open face sandwich, mashed potatoes, gravy. And we just told them over the phone, by the time it gets there from the time we cook, you know, that's a 30 to 45 minute window. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be as hot as it would be in the restaurant. So you, you just need to be upfront and honest with people. If you're not sure how that food's going to carry yet, if you're new, you've got to ask for that forgiveness and give them the heads up before they order it. So, you know, like yesterday they go, Oh no, absolutely. That's totally fine. We understand. They knew, but mm -hmm. I also reinforced it and just helping reinforce that is such a, um, it's a customer experience thing versus just sending it and everybody knows the hot beef is not going to be warm. It's like, yes. let's have a conversation. And that's that one little bitty thing more. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's the biggest thing. Just make sure you're walking everyone through what your new process is like and they'll help you. Our guests will tell us when we're messing up because we've opened the door for that critiquing from them. That's a really good point. I mean, I think out of all of the situation across all industries, communication, communication, communication. So it's that piece of not only communicating the information, but the way you're doing it creates a relationship with the customer. And I think that's the piece that I've seen really come through with what you guys are doing and why it feels um, so positive as I watch things roll out on Facebook. Um, we'll continue to, to talk a little bit about the ideas that you guys have come up with, but. Um, the, the only other thing too, I, I really want to mention is you got to own the mistakes, mm -hmm. especially, you know, us, even, even though we started delivering earlier, like if, if we open up and pretend that we're great at it and we've been doing this for six months, Mm -hmm. We're just, we're fooling ourselves. So we need to, we need to go into it going, okay, we're going to do this at 110%. And when those mistakes come along, own them. We sent Great some advice. out last night where we forgot the piece of pie in the bag and the rest of their food went out and it was a curbside pickup. They, they came here to pick up their food. We're, you better believe we're going to deliver that piece of pie to them and not make them come. like, that's just, that's just how you have to handle it. Mm -hmm. And it can't be a, you know, we all hold each other accountable because we all have weak moments. So mm -hmm. my staff will hold me accountable if I'm having that weak moment or I'll hold them accountable. But that line has to be set and there always has to be someone that's calling everyone else on, on that line. Mm -hmm. Creating that expectation. But you got so, to own those mistakes in the, in the process of trying something new. So one of the things that I see you doing that I see a ton of excitement around is your Facebook Live community bingo. So talk a little bit about how you came up with that idea and rolled it out. First off, if somebody has like a super high-end video camera, we love it because the quality we know is super cheesy on it right now. Uh, we were, so, so our staff sitting down and because of our size, because of our culture, because of how long we've had our staff, we have all these things working for us as a business and as a culture. The way that we're viewing COVID-19 in our town is we're set up to be a leader in our industry, in the community, and in Cedar Valley. We just are because of what we've been doing for years now. And not everyone else is set up to be able to do that. So we sat down with our managers and we said, here's what, here's what we're going to do. Like, you guys need to focus on everything and we're going to start developing content. And we have spent so much time developing content that doesn't have to do with retailing our business. Mm -hmm. Because that's not what our community needs right now. Our community is doing fine, supporting us financially, supporting the other restaurants financially and getting us through. They don't need us to market to them right now. What we need is this voice of reason that says, hey, we know everyone, we know there's plenty of fear out there. So let's not focus on fear right now. Let's just focus on the things we know and that we're a community and our staff needed to wrap their heads around my mindset on this. And they did. They started coming up with these stinking ideas. And I don't know, I don't know where they came from. Uh, mm -hmm. We were sitting down one day and I don't even know whose idea it was because we're just all spitballing stuff. Um, and we came up with this idea for let's do bingo. Like, okay, we just put these big beer boards up and they had like 
80 spaces on them in the bingo sheet 75 and it just kind of worked out we're like well we can make huge bingo cards out of this yeah it's perfect <laughs> well, it's awesome and we had no idea how to do it because i hadn't worked on zoom i'd never done facebook live and so we started talking to morgan who does all of our marketing and we're spitballing different ideas on ways to do this and it just it organically just happened and then we did it the first week and we had 75 people we sent out 75 cards we're like oh that was that was kind of fun and we got some really neat reactions we got some pictures from families saying oh this was great it's what we needed this week uh they were they were just they were sitting there with their bingo stampers at home and mm -hmm. uh, so we talked to the staff and i said hey here's the thing i go this was really neat i go it's going to grow next week and i go then we're going to have to figure out something else because it won't last because that's from what i what i've seen in marketing and what i've seen in just how we are as as a society we usually get burnt out on ideas quickly mm -hmm. now. Um, so we do it the second week and the second week was our 50s theme i think no the second week we brought in somebody else we brought in tyson beach and we got to talk to him about his business and owning it and his growth in waverly and it added this new component to it now it and was that's, that's a piece i loved seeing I'm not even playing bingo and I'm watching it on Friday nights and just the comments, but well, that's it, the piece I loved about what you did too, is it was a bit of share the love. Yeah. And yeah. so your prizes are coming from other sometimes restaurants, um, other businesses up and down main street and around Waverly. Yeah. It's, it's been really, really neat to see. So, you know, that's, that grew. So we got done the second day and we had about 170 people playing. We're like, wow. And people kept asking us like right away, people were like, well, can I get a bingo card for next week? And in my mind, like we weren't doing this again because it's, it's, it's time consuming. I spent about three hours a week right now sending mm -hmm. bingo cards out on Facebook messenger and our staff stays here. They volunteer their time at the end of the night. The ones that are helping out with bingo and we got six people on staff that have to stay here monitoring the cards and crossing the number. Like it's become this thing. And it's, it's us hanging out at the end of the day. Well, and you guys look like you're having fun, which translates. Well, and you also are able to very easily socially distance. So you're checking a lot of boxes there. Well, that was that was the other thing is how do we do this and how do we get people to understand that uh, a lot of people are, they were concerned about the social distancing aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing everybody has to remember about the restaurant world is that when we're cooking online and when we have people in the kitchen, we're, we are together more than most families are together, especially the crew we have right now. Mm -hmm. Because we're such a limited crew that's working so many hours, we are literally all together more than we are with our families probably at the end of the day, mm -hmm. as far as awake hours. Um, so for us to be near each other is no different um, than a family being together at home anymore. And we, we've talked to the staff, you know, we do the temperature checks in the morning and we make sure that, you know, no one else in somebody's house has, like there's plenty of checks you go through, but it's been just a neat way to give everyone at home some sense of community. And that's what this was all about is how do we use our following on Facebook and on social media and our regulars, how do we use that to still establish a sense of community? Because that's what this restaurant has done for 18 years when we've been open how do we do that online well and what's interesting is you talk about it not being a marketing event and i know that wasn't its intent at all but that feel good and again continuing the relationship in a different way is what you've created through that so i think if businesses can understand that especially restaurants um but that is possible even though social media is sometimes considered um not very touchy-feely direct Mm -hmm. um, but there's a piece in that story, too, that I thought was interesting, as you said, I had no familiarity with Facebook Live, and I know we have a ton of people that are in that position as well, and I think you had staff that you could reach out to. I think anybody that's in the restaurant business that feels like they're struggling with that, um, between contacts and people they know, the other thing is that's one of our areas here at UNI that we do do and have some opportunities to help individuals that well uh, in that arena. So if somebody's feeling like I can't even figure out how to get out of the blocks, 
there is plenty of help around and it's not too late at this point. Yeah, so, and, you know, like us, we're so close here. So I fall back on the staff because they're able to handle whatever we need. Um, other businesses, again, haven't spent years developing that culture. So I think reaching out to somebody like you guys over there, I mean, that's huge. And that needs to be, that's the most important part of the business ownership is know when you need to reach out for help. And right now, you know, if we're too, uh, if we're too prideful as an owner, that's not going to help us get out of this. Well, so and we've had excellent examples because we also look to our clients and businesses around Iowa to help each other. And we've had tremendous success and support that way too. So we've been able to put businesses in contact with each other uh, to kind of lend an ear and support. I know that the restaurant association obviously is around and is a source, but there certainly are no lack of sources that I want to make sure that restaurants understand are available. Yeah. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time. So I do want to ask or kind of end with, um, as you look ahead, what can customers do to help support you? And what words of advice do you have for restaurants going forward? Um. That's a good one. I've never thought about asking a guest. We use the word guest to set customer, so I've never thought about <laughs> asking a guest what they could do for us. I, I, there's nothing else they can do right now. I mean, they have done, I'm just overwhelmed by the support of not just Waverly, mm -hmm. but Denver. The we did Tripola. We did a delivery drop in Tripola on Tuesday and it was so phenomenal that we had to cut them off because we couldn't take more orders. Um, we're going to Reedland next week. The support from Waverly and these smaller communities around us has been phenomenal. If they can maintain that for another four weeks, because that's probably what we're looking at, mm -hmm. if they can maintain that for another four weeks, we come through this thing um, and I think we are stronger foundationally than we were going into it. And you get to celebrate the success of keeping 35 individuals and, moving and, forward. Yeah, we, we, we really awesome. enjoy this staff before and we want them all back. And, and there's a whole nother game. Our industry, I don't think um, a lot of people understand, it's going to be very hard for some of our staff to come back to work when we're not busy, especially as a server. Yeah. Because the, the, the um, employment situation, the unemployment situation right now, you know, it'll be very hard for a, a server, and we, we're having these conversations internally right now. You know, if we bring a server back right now and we're not busy, that person's taking a, a fairly decent pay cut from the unemployment benefit they're on right now. And it's a struggle. I just listened to a CEO in Texas talk about um, our industry right now, if we open up at 25%, for us, we probably will just continue to do curbside and delivery. Mm -hmm. so we can open up at about 75%. Financially, it becomes very hard for us as a restaurant to provide the service we need to. And it becomes really hard to ask your staff to come back. So there's going to be this really interesting tightrope that our industry is going to be going through behind the scenes. Yeah, that is a balancing act. There's going to be a lot of, you talked communication before, we are, um, we are going to have a really interesting balancing act over the next eight weeks. And um, I think the takeaway for our industry, outside of that, making sure your staff is super aware of what's going on and why we're making decisions we are as owners, because there's going to be very, there's going to be tons of questions on the decisions we're making over the next eight weeks to six months. Mm -hmm. Our industry needs to remember that when we reopen, even at 100%, our industry just changed. Our whole industry just went through a pivot. And if the assumption is that we get to reopen and run businesses normal, those are the restaurants that will have a hard time. Mm -hmm. so, you know, if everybody's listening, I, I like to make sure that we're all on the same page and understand we need to figure out delivery. We need to figure out how to get our food off site. And I want other businesses to do this well because the more businesses that do it well, the better the competition is out there for us. Mm -hmm. the makes everybody, the better, everybody better. Absolutely. It's the same thing for you and I. So you and I as a college and you and I as people. But you and I, <laughs> I know it gets confusing sometimes. 
<laughs> well, that concludes our time. I want to thank Matt, uh, for one, for sharing um, such pivotal information in terms of how you guys are doing things and what that process looks like. I also know that you're an awesome resource if somebody has questions, um, right. that they can reach out to you and you are very quick at responding on Facebook <laughs> in terms of messages. Also remind people that we are just at the University of Northern Iowa. So you can find us online if you Google or go to Advance Iowa, all of our contact information is there. And, and there are a host of other COVID related topics that have been recorded and are available at any time to listen to. Matt talked about the insurance issue that was talked about last week or the week before. So there almost isn't a topic that you can't find. If you can't find the answer, we're here for you. So I want to remind everybody to continue to be safe, support your local restaurants, and applaud them for all the hard work that they're doing for your community. So hey, Jane, thanks thank again, you. Matt. Thank you for the work you and your team are doing over there too. That's awesome that you guys are putting together all these resources right now. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Thanks, Matt. Have a good Have day. Have a good weekend. Thank you, you too. Thanks.